<laughs> Welcome, world. <laughs> Coffee's mine. Or tea. Get my phone back. My crowding. There we go. We're good. Oops, we can't hear you, Rob. I didn't say anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's a good reason. It's getting set up here. Okay. No rush. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. <clears throat> uh, today. I think uh, we have the opportunity to have one of the most interesting, challenging conversations one can have in life um, about the nature of suffering, how we respond to it, uh, how we interpret it, how our tradition interprets it. <clears throat> I titled our our conversation today about uh, Job, the man who taught God. Um, we're going to save that title until the very end um, and discuss if, in fact, there's any truth to that title. Um, what I'd like to do by way of beginning is I'm going to share something different than that opening screen. Whoops. Wrong one. There we go. And let's take <laughs> a moment and let us listen to this. Evan did slimy and wrong, but this day could have been so much worse. I'm just glad you're okay. Okay, newsflash. I'm not okay. I'm not okay with a mediocre job. I'm not okay with a mediocre apartment. I'm not okay with a mediocre life. Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know this film, I assume, from uh, Bruce Almighty. Everybody familiar with it? Hmm. What, what's well, I encourage you. I encourage you to watch it. Uh, hold on one second. Yeah, I did see that. Oh. I encourage you to watch it. And then I'm also going to pull up. Thank God you're all right. God, yeah, let's thank God, shall we? For his blessings are raining down upon me. Wait, that's not rain. Bruce, please don't do that, honey. You know that everything happens for a reason. Do you all that see this? No. No. Okay. no. We're not seeing it. We're in the hands. We're Hold on. Bush. I have no bird. I have no bush. God has taken. Hold on. <laughs> I will get it right. I promise. <laughs> Did you say the right blessing? I think so. <laughs> Marlene Hickman. Yeah. Here we go, screen share, and open Chrome right there. My thank God you're all right. God, yeah, let's thank God, shall we? For his blessings are raining down upon me. Wait, that's not rain. Bruce, please don't do that, honey. You know that everything happens for a reason. That I don't need. That is a cliche. That is not helpful to me. A bird in the hands were two in the bush. I have no bird. I have no bush. God has taken my bird in my bush. Oh, I see. So, so God is picking on you? Is that what you're saying? No, he's ignoring me completely. He's far too busy giving Evan everything he wants. Oh, that's great, Sam. But you missed your target. I'm over here. Don't get mad at the dog. It's not the dog's fault. No, it's God's fault. I gave him the wrong coordinates. <laughs> Are you stop being such a martyr? I am not being a martyr. I'm a victim. <clears throat> not a mean kid sitting on an anthill with a magnifying glass. And I'm the ant. He could fix my life in five minutes if he wanted to, but he'd rather burn off my feelers and watch me squirm. All right, sweetheart, I know that you're mad. It's completely understandable. What Evan did is slimy and wrong. 
but this day could have been so much worse. I'm just glad you're okay. Okay? Newsflash! I'm not okay. I'm not okay with a mediocre job. I'm not okay with a mediocre apartment. I'm not okay with a mediocre life! All right. Yes, he's got some fixing to mm -hmm. do. He got some issues. He definitely has some issues. So um, <clears throat> that predicament uh, uh, in the film, uh, Bruce Almighty, which I do encourage you to see, <clears throat> goes back quite a few years, but it's uh, raised a number of interesting questions on the whole subject um, that is originally dealt with in the book of Job. <clears throat> it's worth noting Job is not the original uh, aspect of ancient literature addressing the question of suffering. Uh, there's actually uh, some earlier Babylonian documents <clears throat> that uh, address the question of suffering and, and the role of the divine in suffering. So we're going to uh, uh, take a look at the book of Job. <clears throat> I'm going to go over today, we're going to be able to cover uh, the background of the book will be able to look at the, um, the preface, the opening part of the book. <clears throat> and then I have some quotes to share for us to discuss. So we talk about the book of Job, it's important to note, it's the second most interpreted story in the Bible. Uh, and the one that has been written about most of all is the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. And second to that, it is this book of Job uh, that has been written about most. It's uh, been described as one of the classics of Western culture with, quote, manifold influence on theology, philosophy, art, and literature. Now, uh, we often uh, discuss Job uh, in connection to Deuteronomy. And I've I brought this up before in previous classes. Um, and uh, we're going to look at that, just revisit that idea, Job's relationship with Deuteronomy. Uh, you've heard the phrase, men tacht und Gott lacht, uh, man plans and God laughs. Uh, this notion that for all of our human ability uh, to interpret the world, a plan uh, for our futures, um, in, in reality, uh, control, um, of our lives is an illusion, according to some views. And, you know, so we're busy here on earth, uh, you know, planning our lives. And in response, you know, God, God laughs. Uh, and there's a wonderful uh, Midrash story, uh, which tells the story of an argument uh, between uh, Rabbi Joshua uh, and the disciples of another rabbi. And they're trying to decide whether an oven is kosher or not. And uh, in the argument, uh, Rabbi Joshua says, I am so sure that this oven is kosher, uh, that the walls of the schoolhouse will shake. And right before the eyes of the disciples, the walls of the schoolhouse shake, and the disciples respond and say, ah, that's well and good, but God gave the Torah to us. The Torah is now on earth and it's up to us to decide. And we've decided that the, the oven is not kosher. So Rabbi Joshua responds and said, look, I am so sure that this oven is kosher that the water in the river will change direction and flow upstream. And right before their eyes, the water changes direction and goes upstream. And the disciples in response say, ah, that's well and good, but God gave the Torah to us. Torah is now on earth and we've made a decision. The oven is not kosher. So finally, Rabbi Joshua says, I'm so sure that this oven is kosher, that there'll be a bot coal a voice from heaven will tell you that the oven is kosher. And at that moment, there's a voice from heaven. The oven is kosher. 
And the disciples respond, ah, that's all well and good. But God gave the Torah to us, and it's now here on earth. And we have decided the oven is not kosher. And the way this story ends, this Midrashic story ends, is it says, you know, God has been, you know, in the heavens observing this whole encounter. And uh, it said, God, God relaxes back in God's throne and laughs, mm -hmm. referring to this, and laughs and said, ah, my children have overtaken me. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we talk about God laughing, God's reaction to the, the foibles of human existence. Uh, that Midrash I find particularly powerful because God gave us free will and we live with the consequences of that free will. Um, now, this notion, uh, on the one hand, that God gives us free will stands in contrast to the fact that in spite of that, there are so many things about which we have no control whatsoever. And so this, this uh, you know, Yiddish cliche, men tracht und Gott lacht, is, uh, is really, um, it's, a, it's, it's stating the conundrum that, that Job is actually addressing in this book. So in Deuteronomy, just to understand Job in relationship uh, to <clears throat> other parts of the Bible, and I, let me say parenthetically, there are many things in the, in the, the entire Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, uh, even sections of the Torah, sections of the prophets, sections of the writings or books themselves uh, that uh, are often studied in relationship to one another, either as a point counterpoint um, or as presenting, you know, even conflicting views between different sections and different books of the Bible. Uh, Deuteronomy often taught in relationship to Job and vice versa, offers a very straightforward and uh, some would say deeply satisfying view of the universe. Oops. And I'm sorry, I broke off that paragraph there. And it basically is this, if you behave well and follow the Lord, good things will happen to you. If you turn away from God and sin, disaster will follow. Uh, it's satisfying because it's so logical and it's satisfying, at least for some, because it's perfectly just. It gives us a world that's clear and comprehensible. God is involved in history and every event reflects the divine will. Uh, it's either God rewarding the good or punishing the wicked. And this, I call this the childlike view, a view that many of us were raised with, and uh, maybe not even explicitly, but tacitly uh, in our, our Jewish upbringing. Uh, if I think back on, uh, maybe think back on your own, if you had early Jewish education in a cheder or a Hebrew school, um, think about for a second, I'm gonna pull the group uh, how God was portrayed. Um, and if in fact God was portrayed as sort of the one who rewards the good and punishes the bad, and it was kind of a very straight up simplistic equation. I wonder if others of you were raised with that. I certainly was. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. I don't think I was in particular, but I mean, okay. I think about it, you know, so many cultures sort of have that underpinning to their world outlook, right? So many primitive cultures do. Yes. I did not. Were you raised, with, what were you, what kind of, you know, basic image of God's role in relationship to humans were you raised with? Actually, I, I, I can't remember any. Uh, my family was originally associated with a uh, conservative synagogue uh, that broke up. And uh, most of my family went to, to a reform synagogue. And I, when I was a junior in high school, I went across the street to the conservative synagogue. So it's, 
that God just didn't come into it. it. There were other things that propelled me in that direction. Now, maybe, you know, I was, I was fortunate in that I grew up in a, in a, a early childhood environment where this, there was still Yiddish culture with my great grandfather being alive until I was 15. And he was from the old country. Um, and uh, we had a thing in our family. Uh, this is the caricature of it, but it's, this is how it really went. You know, I, rem I have a vivid memory. I think I must have been, oh, maybe 12 or 13 years old. And I had some kind of argument with my mother. And as I stormed out of the room, I stubbed my toe. And oh, her response God's was, punishing God, you. God punished you. <laughs> God punished you. I've heard and, that. Right? And so I, I, I realized in retrospect, I was raised with that idea. <laughs> and, and if I misbehaved and then it, it came back on me right away, you know, my mother was always reminding me, God punished you, you know. Um, it's... Yeah, I, yeah, I ended up, I, I heard those little comments, I think, from my mom as well, but uh, never really grew up in fear of God. Never, you know, God will do this if you do that. It was more of, I guess, you know, the cliche is in awe of God that, you know, if God wanted to, he could make a, a, a broomstick shoot. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, whatever God chooses, you know, can happen. And so in an instance, like, like you're referring to rabbi, if I would stub my toe, whatever, uh, I think my mom would comment, especially if I just did something wrong was you see what you get, you know, without referencing God directly. It's just more right. like you see what happens, you know, you see what you get, which kind of still referenced it, but, uh, Without really naming God, I didn't know much. I was I was definitely raised with that at Temple Aaron, um, and it, and it's in the in the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I'll be you'll be inscribed for the Book of Life if you do good, and if you're a person, you'll be inscribed. And the the opposite of that is if you're not, you will be punished. You will be um, you will not be allowed to live. So I, which to me is a real primitive way of looking at God and such a simplistic view, but um, it was good people live a long time and bad people die. And that's absolutely false. <laughs> I was raised. Hmm. Anyone else want to comment at this? I've, I'd like to comment. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't really raised as a child with any sort of conception of God. So... Um, there wasn't really talk or the idea about, um, you know, how God would treat us or, you know, that just, that just wasn't a part of my childhood. And it wasn't until I became a teenager that I started sort of considering the idea of, idea of God. And, um, in the beginning there, um, I, I actually, I actually thought, well, if there is a God, I, I probably hate him because there's so many bad things that happen in the world that don't make sense. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my, that was my, kind of my first idea of, of God as a, as a teenager. David. I, I don't think I was raised with God as a, as a reference point growing up. My, my views is, is that Torah means instruction. And after that, we are free agents. The Torah can be attributed to God, and that's fine, but we're free agents, and we have to understand and put in context, which changes over time, what it is to be a good human being, a good Jew, and try to achieve whatever the end result might exist in your own mental definition of why we're here. The rabbis um, <clears throat> often try to address 
the most profound or complex issues uh, with um, with conundrum type statements, mm -hmm. um, recognizing that the truth falls somewhere in a continuum of ideas, uh, rather than the world being, you know, and intellectually speaking, uh, the world being black and white, it's, you know, we live within a continuum of possibilities. So on the subject of free will, I, I, I'm sure I've mentioned it here before, the rabbi said uh, something that seems contradictory until you try to understand it. Uh, they said, all is foreseen mm -hmm. and, and free will is given. Mm -hmm. uh, and we wonder what is that what what is that actually saying? So all is foreseen is saying that God has foreknowledge of all cause and effect. So in for any individual, uh, we go through the path of life and we come to these forks in the road, and God can see the outcome of all forks in the scheme of an individual person's life. Um, it's like God is such a master chess player. God can see the infinite number of possible moves on the board at any given moment of time for any individual at any given moment of time. So God can see that. So we come to a fork in the road and we happen to, we make the wrong choice. God is not gonna become inserted into that moment, but God is aware before we are that it's not the best choice. But because we have free will, the other side of the equation, we're gonna make choices. The question that gets raised by the Jewish theologians is, so if God has foreknowledge of all of our choices or possible choices and consequences, does that actually make free will an illusion? That is God's foreknowledge of anything about the universe actually a determination of the outcome of those things? So is God's foreknowledge deterministic or not? It's kind of the, the basic theological, philosophical question. Um, if I know something for sure in advance, does that mean that foreknowledge determines the outcome of that in, in advance? And so the rabbis don't solve the problem of free will and God's you know, huge psychic capacity that allows God to see and embrace a much you know, infinite set of possibilities and to be able to see them all distinctly. Whereas, you know, what do they say? How many moves ahead does the grandmaster chess players, how many moves ahead do they, can they think? I don't know, but I think it's like 20 moves maybe. Um, and God can think infinitely of the moves. Um, the thing about Deuteronomy is Deuteronomy packages the world so simplistically, you're almost, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, your life is proscribed and it relieves the angst of not knowing where one stands in the universe. Um, and even in the Jewish tradition and we and, and Jewish community, we have a segment of our community that feels very safe in the Deuteronomistic worldview. And there are people in other religious civilizations as well who share that very, we would call it simplistic. And they, they would say, no, it's not simplistic. It's, it's, it's just clear. It's just clear. Um, but now moving further down this, this slide, um, we, but in, in, in Jewish life, we recognized early on that the Deuteronomy perspective was a simplistic view. Um, and that's why, uh, this is, was said to me in rabbinic school, Jewish theology doesn't end with the five books of Moses. 
Um, and the thing is, for most Jews, most of us derive our sense of, of Jewish historicity, a sense of, of Jewish origin, a sense of basic Jewish values from the five books of Moses. Uh, in fact, most Jews have what they know of the five books of Moses is either they, in the exceptional case where someone actually sits down and reads the Hebrew Bible from cover to cover, which by the way is a rarity, um, or they've learned the stories, Bible stories, either by being in synagogue or by having some kind of Jewish education. But uh, for most people, the story of Judaism begins with Genesis and ends with Deuteronomy. Um, and yet you have these two major sections of the Hebrew Bible, all of the prophets and all of the writings as well. And in this case, Job stands in response to the book of Deuteronomy. So it's, a, and the, so the book of Job, um, uh, for instance, Deuteronomy's theology is utterly repudiated in the book of Job. So what do we know about him? Uh, Job is a good man um, and he is suffering. And I wonder uh, how many of us have had this experience where we've, we've done the right thing, we've been kind, we've been good, and the onslaught just still doesn't end. Mm -hmm. Like all the good deeds in the world doesn't change, you know, sometimes the onslaught that life brings. And so what happens is, and it, the thing I love about the book of Job is, you know, Job represents every single human um, in a very realistic way, because when we go through hard times, uh, the most difficult of times, at least I know I do, when I'm like really going, you know, what, the, what is going on? Um, I talk to my friends. And that's exactly what happens in Job. His friends try to explain his suffering. Um, but all of them, as you go into the book, um, they try to explain his suffering with the traditional worldview. If bad things happen, they tell him, you must have done something wrong. But uh, Job insists uh, that uh, on standing on his integrity, you know, saying, you know, I am a good person and these things can't be happening to me because there's something wrong with me. We have to be able to talk about other reasons why this is happening, why these things are happening. And the entire book is a story. You know, sometimes people read Job and they focus on, you know, the, the variations of the responses by the friends. Um, but the friends' responses are all about returning to the basic simplistic view, cause and effect. But Job basically he does something so incredibly powerful is he doesn't blame God for what's going on around him. He, sa he says, no matter whatever happens here, I'm still me. Um, and that notion of being able to maintain one's identity, one's integrity, one's core values in the face of you know, tremendous hardship in the face of tremendous suffering um, is a whole nother metric of, of how to live in this world. There's, there's a, a story of um, a group of inmates in Auschwitz um, who had decided that uh, what was happening with the Holocaust uh, was a shanda, a disgrace, and that they put God on trial. And they met for days and they, they debated back and forth about God's blame in the Holocaust and the Shoah. And they did this over the course of a week. And Friday afternoon, Friday afternoon, they finally, the verdict is announced that God is guilty and at that very moment, Shabbat began 
So they dismissed the court and they said, okay, God is guilty. Now it's time to pray. <laughs> pray to God. God is guilty, but it's still time to pray. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that's an interesting um, conjecture that um, we may want to blame God, um, but does blaming God or being angry at God also require rejection of God? Um, and unfortunately, that's an equation that does become rooted for many, many people going through very hard times is that God is responsible and God is blamed and their relationship is shut off with the Almighty. I can tell you as a rabbi, I've been through that in my own life where I, I literally out loud, you know, shook my hand at the heavens and said, the deal is off. <laughs> The deal is off. And, you know, and I pouted and I, uh, but eventually I stopped pouting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's when I had a, rab a rabbi that I uh, highly respect, respect. Bernard Melman said to me, um, he said, guess what? You know, you've been pouting for a long time. He said, guess what? God's still there waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Job um, who insists that his integrity should be the source of his understanding about the meaning of life. Uh, you know, not this you know, traditional cause and effect idea, um, because he, he is indeed an innocent man, uh, and the, his suffering comes upon him through no fault of his own. And in a way, in contrast to Deuteronomy, never again, says the book of Job, uh, may we interpret the universe in a simplistic fashion. And never again should we take history as a direct reflection of God's will. Uh, and never again should we presume to second guess what God has in mind. In other words, and that last one's a little confusing because it's really saying is never again should we just assume, you know, a good thing happens, we get rewarded, a bad thing happens, we get punished. We shouldn't assume what actually is going on in God's mind, because that's what the Deuteronomists are doing. The Deuteronomists, in some respects, are showing a kind of spiritual arrogance by saying, well, we know what's in God's mind. And the only way to make the world sensible is reward and punishment. Can I ask now, a question? Yes, please. I, I, I understand uh, the different point of view in the book of Job. What bothers me about the book of Job is that everything that happens is the result basically of a bet between God and Satan. We're coming up to it. And, and it seems unfortunate that he suffers the way he suffers as the result of a bet rather than what was actually going to happen in his life anyway. That's all. No, and... I'm, I'm glad you said that, Charles. And we're, that's actually, we're going to look at that opening part with Satan in just a minute, a minute away. So a word, we have a word in philosophy, uh, which uh, describes uh, this problem called the problem of evil. Uh, the book of Job has been called the most difficult book of the Bible for good reason. And there are numerous exegeses of the book of Job. Uh, and uh, again, attempts to reconcile the coexistence of evil and God, for which Leibniz, uh, who's a European philosopher, 1646 to 1716, coined the term, which we use to this day, to talk about the coexistence of evil and God. And that word is theodicy, theodicy. It's a good word to know. 
Now, scholars are divided um, as to what the original intent of the poem of Job, they, some scholar, I'd like to think of it as a poem, uh, what the original intent of the poem was. Um, and there are some that suggest it really was meant as a satire of puritanical religion. Um, and, you know, the history of the world is built on local puritanical religion. Um, I had the privilege uh, when I was the president and CEO of Religion in American Life, uh, which is America's, at its time, America's oldest interfaith national organization. And we gave an annual award each year to a, a great American who had contributed to the conversation about religiosity. And we gave the award one year to Bill Moyers. And I had the pleasure of you know, spending an afternoon with him. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, you know, the problem with the world uh, is that uh, people are at war over their local gods. And it was that phrase, local gods, that really struck me that um, people have their local beliefs, the beliefs that extend this far from here to here, um, and assume that the locality of their faith um, extends to uh, you know, global control. And um, he gave a talk uh, when he received this award um, about his, you know, perceptions uh, in world history about puritanical religion and the tendency that humans have uh, to assume and then project that their local belief is a globe is a global absolute. And uh, we see this all the time. Um, and uh, in some ways, we don't often think of the book of Job as a commentary on that, but in some ways it is as well, not only on the problem of theodicy, but also on the problem of, you know, I, uh, we often call it religious triumphalism. So we'll do a quick overview of the book. It is considered a wisdom book, partly by the way of the, of the language, um, but also because it's, it's really not an historical book, um, like say the five books of Moses or the prophets. Uh, it in, in, has some characteristics similar to Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs. Um, it is highly poetic and metaphorical. Um, it, it, it deals with mature reflection on issues of everyday living. Uh, in contrast to Proverbs, uh, but like Ecclesiastes, Job, Job must be read in its entirety to understand its message. Single verses often contradict the message of the, of the overall book. And it's interesting because, you know, I will tell you something. It's not just in the Jewish world. It's in all uh, communities that have a scriptural uh, base uh, at work, you know, people cherry, it's called cherry picking scripture. Mm -hmm. People cherry pick scripture all the time uh, for good or for ill. Um, but there are some things and most commentators agree, it's very difficult to cherry pick the book of Job. Uh, to fully appreciate it, it should be read uh, in its entirety. Uh, and as said also, repeat, I'm repeating, the stance of Job it counterbalances and challenges certainly the perspectives of uh, the specter of Deuteronomy, but also the book of Proverbs, uh, which people cherry pick probably more than any other book in the Bible. And um, there are things in Proverbs that very much sound like Deuteronomy. Now, here's the thing. People have said the thing that makes the Bible the Bible is that God is the main character. Um, 
But typical of wisdom thinking, um, the other thing, and this is where I, I start to explain the title for today. Um, Job views the world from the perspective of human need and concern rather than from God's requirements. So instead of the fixation being, what can I do to please God? What can I do? What does God want? What does God demand? What does God require? How do I obey? How do I conform? How do I fit in? Job actually takes it from a completely different perspective, which is saying, and it's not narcissistic, but Job is saying, but what about me? What about me? And I'll tell you, it reminds me, you know, we have a, um, we talk in philosophy about, you know, there's all kinds of isms in philosophy. Um, and, you know, one of the most common isms is idealism. And to understand what we mean by idealism is like the following. Um, idealists will talk about what happens when you die and say, hey, you shouldn't be upset when you die um, because when you die, you can think about the droplet of your life that you added to the great ocean of existence. And that little droplet of your life has contributed to the grand whole of everything. And so you, you can idealize your little temporal life and then see it as so valuable in the vast extending infinity of all existence. And, you know, the response to the idealist by the existentialist is, that's all well and good, but what about me? You know, what about the me, the, the consciousness? What about the me, the personality? What about the me, the collection of history and stories and encounters and relationships? What about, you know, the essence, you know, of my presence? You know, it's not enough to know I'm going to be a droplet in the great well of all existence. And uh, that's also why I admire the book of Job so much, because the book of Job is in some ways a precursor to a, a very uh, important time in the history of philosophy, um, where particularly in the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, where there was a lot of debate between existentialism and uh, idealists and existentialists. And uh, Job is, in a sense, uh, giving a foreshadowing of that. Little on the historical background, the author is unknown. Also, where we have many theories about authorship and other parts of the Bible, um, there's no book of either the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament, interestingly, for which we have less idea about the author, the date, the place of the writing, or even the context of the writing. And, you know, <laughs> there are three theories of, of, of origin. Uh, which, of course, you know, basically cover the three basic periods of prophetic um, expression in ancient Jewish history, um, either written in the time of Isaiah, Isaiah uh, before the exile, uh, or written during the exile, or written after the exile. <laughs> when we talk about origins of Hebrew books of the Bible, it, it's it, usually in one of three, three time periods before the exile, during the exile, or after the exile. The place of the writing is unknown, but there are three theories about Job. One, that Job was an historic figure who spoke all the words attributed to him. Uh, two, that Job is just a literary creation by the author who is intending to write a parable, a teaching parable. And the third is that there's some historical kernel here um, adapted by the author to address the issues that Job addresses. But the thing about Job also is that these unknowns or theories about origin um, really don't make a difference in the meaning of the book or the impact of the book. Um, and here's the basic message. I'm just curious, this is not intended as a test or you know anything. How many 
here have actually read the book of Job from beginning to end. It's okay if you haven't, most people haven't. Um, the, the basic message of the book for those who haven't re read it is righteous people suffer unjustly, unjustly. In contrast to the traditional view um, that orthodox or traditional answers are not always true or appropriate. And God will tolerate honest questions. And that notion, I mean, we've seen it so many other places in the Bible where God is questioned, where God even changes God's mind. And I've had a number of conversations with people over the years who will argue with me and saying, God, God doesn't really change God's mind. It just looks like God changes God's mind. Because if God changes God's mind, then God is no longer omniscient, meaning all-knowing. And remember, the traditional ideas around the God of the Bible is God is omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, eternal, and omniscient, all-knowing. And an omniscient God doesn't change. Whereas Job makes it very clear, God can tolerate honest questions. Just like my rabbi friend, Rabbi Melman said, you know, you pouted for how long did you pout? And now you're done and God's still there. God could take it. Fourth, sin is not always the cause of evil and suffering in the world. That the doc, this notion of the doctrine of retribution uh, does not hold. And then in Job, we, we learn, and this is his perspective, in spite of all this, God should be served simply because God is God. Not because God rewards, not because God punishes, simply because God is God. And last, God in the world cannot be put into easily definable categories. And I always say, that's Judaism's assertion of the noble gray area of life, where we Jews like to live. So in the book, let's I don't know, tell you a little bit about him. Job is a wealthy and righteous nobleman. Uh, he has a large family, many flocks of animals, many servants, a large home maybe in a state. His righteousness is carefully designed to protect his family. Uh, he offers sacrifices for sin uh, that might have even just been committed inadvertently uh, during the feast celebrated by his children. Um, and you know, we're told this, Job is like the, a righteous embodiment of a Torah loving Jew. But what happens is, after introducing Job, the author shifts the scene to the court of heaven where Yahweh praises Job for his righteous character. And the heavenly adversary, Satan, important heavenly adversary, Satan is not the Satan character of other traditions or Christianity. It's not the devil. It's not the embodiment of evil. It's just a heavenly adversary, in a sense, an angel or a, a ministering uh, um, assistant in the host of heaven. These beings, which we find throughout Midrashic literature and even here in the Bible, that uh, with, with whom God interacts. Uh, and from a literary standpoint, they serve all kinds of roles. Sometimes they are foils for God, sometimes they are antagonists, sometimes they are protagonists. And here we have the heavenly adversary, Satan replies that Job acts righteous, but accuses him of doing so in order to just to receive God's blessings. It's like, yeah, he does all these right things, but he's only doing it for what he can get out of it. 
he he's only being this righteous guy to get reward and satan is questioning that so satan then challenges god to let satan afflict job with the loss of all his material blessings to see whether or not job's devotion to god is genuine or not so yahweh accepts the challenge with the only stipulation that Satan not harm Job physically. And we then overhear a series of reports to Job uh, describing the loss of his children and all his possessions to natural calamities or enemy tribes. And Job begins to grieve, but the text says, but he had not sinned. Satan then acknowledges Job's faithfulness to Yahweh, but claims that such faithfulness would crumble in the face of illness. And so then Yahweh gave Satan permission to afflict Job's body with the restriction that he not be killed. Satan then attacked Job with these, the text says, loathsome sores. Uh, when I was in Hebrew school, they said they were boils. From the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, Job's wife suggests that he curse God and die. Job refused and suffered in silence, refusing to sin. And the final seed of the prologue, and this is just from the beginning, uh, the three friends of Job's, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, show up to comfort him. Uh, and they are so astonished by his losses and pain, they sit in silence for seven days. And that's the opening preface of the book summed up for those of you who haven't re read it. Hope you don't mind that we took the time for that, but wanted you to, to know the story. Here's poor Job. Um, there's a lot of art in history uh, depicting Job uh, being afflicted with boils from his head to his feet. So Walter Miller in, in a book called Canical for Leibowitz wrote this, said, listen, my dear Coors, why don't you forgive God for allowing pain? If he didn't allow it, human courage, bravery, nobility, and self-sacrifice would all be meaningless things. And I'm wonder your reaction to this. Well, I have a thought. Um, I kind of look at it like, um, you know, everything we see on the material level isn't all that there is. And um, so I guess my, my view of it is that, I mean, that's true, this statement is true, but it's not for the point of, of, of having courage or bravery. I think that um, the point is more at a soul level you know, that, that we're here, you know, our souls are here to learn and, you know, grow and all those things. And I guess that's where I, uh, that's the only way I can understand it. And the soul's growth is connected to the challenges we live through. Right. And so, you know, I mean, I can think of, yeah, plenty of people who I know are very, very, very good people and they are, definitely experiencing suffering in this lifetime. And, and I think it has to do with their soul's journey and what they're here to learn and experience. David? You know, having been a polio for the last 77 years, I was raised that that has no relevance to who you are and what you can do, do what you can, with what you got and make a life. 
And I feel that I have done that. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Anyone else? Oh, go ahead. Whose hand is up? Someone's hand up? I believe it's mine. Oh, Kathy, go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna refer back to something I read when I was in college, which is uh, the prophet Kahil Gibran, and I know it's Christian, but it made such sense that how would you know what joy and happiness was if you didn't have uh, if you didn't have pain and suffering? There, and again, it goes with Judaism with the idea of everything is in perfect balance. That you have to have suffering and pain in order to know joy and happiness. At least that's what I learned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's neat. Well, it's interesting because, you know, one of the operative paradigms of thought is that, you know, light is good and dark is bad. Uh, this dualistic idea that uh, it's this basis of zero-sum thinking, there have to be winners and losers, what light and dark, good and bad. Um, but of course, you know, now we try to talk about that darkness is not, the absence of light is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh -uh. Um, you know, the, the top side of a leaf that faces the sun you know, also has an underside. Um, and the underside is the part of the leaf where like the veins of the leaf live mm -hmm. on the underside. So the underside props up the part that faces the light. So, um, and I think that's also what Job is suggesting that this traditional um, bifurcated approach to the world uh, of seeing this disjunction, this either or, um, Job is, you know, challenging that, um, and that, as you just so beautifully said, um, the darkness is part of the light, and the light is part of the darkness. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyone else want to comment? Okay, let's move on. I, like so I, I did find this old old uh, Jewish proverb, uh, he that can't endure the bad will not live to see the good. I wonder how you feel about this one. sort of an, a truism. You know, I don't know if this has any bearing on that thought, but uh, my mother who recently passed in 93 was uh, um, having, having been a Holocaust survivor and been in Auschwitz and camps for 18 months had very long ill feelings towards God mm. until much more recently in her life. I'd say probably in her 60s, maybe even 70s, when she, uh, I think, came to grip with if it were not for the tragedies of the Shoah, um, Israel would not have formed. You know, we wouldn't have this Jewish nation. And, and, but, you know, she lived for whatever, 60, 70 years with a, a, a very, 50 years, whatever. She was 16 when she was there. So most of her life um, wow. having very, uh, well, I don't know if negative is the right term, but you know, kind of negative feelings towards God. 
but you know, to this point, you can't endure the bad, you're not looking to see the good. So anyone else? Nicholas says. Nicholas has something to say. Nicholas. So I, I got to be honest, these quotes make me very uncomfortable. Um, uh, I, I guess like with this one, um, he that can't endure the bad will not live to see the good. I, I start to think of people like who, like what if you're never, what if you're never taught how to endure the bad? And like you start, I mean, this is, this isn't, this isn't entirely hypothetical. I had a friend who um, committed suicide and I always felt like she was never, she never really had the opportunity to work out the issues that were going on. And, and, um, uh, and, I, and so, yeah, I guess, I guess if you, can't endure the bad you will not live to see the good but i mean i guess that that's true in that sense um uh i just um i guess it i don't know how to say this it it still it still seems unfair and um i I guess that's a lot of what we're talking about. I'm sorry. This is this is just like what's this going is on. Good. My... No, no, no. You're doing great. You're doing great. Yeah. Um, that's about it, though. That's that's what I. That's just what I'm thinking when I'm seeing these quotes. So, I think part of what what we're seeing here is that, in, in some sense, the contrast between Deuteronomy and Job is that in 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 Deuteronomy, the onus is kind of on God, in a sense. God makes the rules, and everything is measured against those rules. You know, God is the centerpiece uh, through which all life is interpreted and all actions are connected. As we say, God acts in history, uh, so that all history, all events are somehow suffused with, with God's will. Um, and Job goes to the opposite uh, basically saying, no, everything filters through human experience. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, uh, what you just pointed out, and, and I, I want to thank you for that, is that because this describes how life filters through human experience, this proverb describes that to the extreme. It's as, it's as, it is, is, it is as, extreme on a human centered uh, experience uh, as Deuteronomy is centered on a God centered experience. And when I first read this, I actually, I read it and then I was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think my life experience tells me there's something true about that. Um, But I don't, I guess the thing is, what does it mean to endure? Um, you know, people who go through in the heart of terrible, terrible suffering of all kinds, uh, whatever the source of it is, um, when I'm in the heart of the pain, I mean, in a way that, the, you know, the real question is, if you've ever been in a situation where you've had extreme, extreme, extreme physical pain, let's say, um, can you experience goodness in the middle of that? Um, that doesn't, what? that's not what it says, Rob, because there is a sequence here. Uh, you will, if you can't endure, you have to endure it, but then subsequently you will be able to see the good. So it's not a case of seeing the good while you're suffering. But that's, I agree with you, but that's the question I'm raising. 
I agree with you, David. This is saying you endure it. And then when you get to the other side of it, you can then see the good. Right. And the fact that you get to the other side of it helps you is what makes seeing the good possible. Um, but I wonder is that, so if people don't experience try, you know, serious trials in their life, does that mean they can't appreciate the good? Uh, I, what, I think, what I think Job is really uh, trying to tell us is that life is not fair. Uh, there are, there's, there's both good and bad, you know, and um, just because you're experiencing the bad, doesn't mean that you shouldn't persevere and and look for the good or try to get the good. And just because you're you're fat and healthy and you're doing really well, doesn't mean that if there's a, an adverse turn that you shouldn't deal with that as well because that's part of life. Life is not fair. No, nobody gets guarantees that it's going to be one way or the other. I think that's, for me at least, that's what Job is telling me. Isn't that what hope is all about? Mm. You can't always see the good when you're in the middle of bad, but you can anticipate it. Try having a baby. <laughs> or, or, or for men, a kidney stone. Oh, he's I've had, had those. Yeah. Okay, that's extreme pain. It is. But with a baby, you know that there's going to be something positive coming with a kidney stone. You know that the pain eventually will be over. <laughs> Good enough. Experience <laughs> teaches you that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Comes back to that hope. You hope it gets <laughs> over with soon. Yes, sooner rather than later. Yeah. Than later. Uh, Minimal damage. So I want to share now this uh, from Elie Wiesel in an interview in 1984 in the Paris Review. Said, I rarely speak about God. To God, yes. I protest against him. I shouted him, but open discourse about the qualities of God, about the problems that God imposes, the Odyssey, no. And yet he is there in silence, in filigree, which is a fascinating quote mm -hmm. from Elie Wiesel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Rabbi, can I say something about this? This um, yes, yeah. For me, I mean, the last um, quote from Elie Wiesel it really speaks to me um, because he suffered immense trauma, and I have come from immense personal trauma, and uh, I found that a lot of these discussions sort of uh, presume that people have a belief in God or come from, you know, situations where other people have a belief of God among, you know, each other, and then you question God. But if you've suffered so much trauma and with no support from people that actually do believe in God in the midst of it, you sort of get to God as a way of reaching out for the good so it's like you come to god through suffering by finding the peace that is there beyond um human suffering beyond human uh, conditions and then you grow in that um connection because what happens when you go through trauma sometimes is that you think am i not good enough for god that this is happening to me <laughs> and then you sort of put all the earthly sort of questions of why things are happening, who is this happening to, by whom is this happening? And then you sort of realize, yes, you're human, but a part of it is 
able to reach out to something that is not human. I mean, we're connected, human, I believe, you know, as humans to the higher, you know, order to the higher beauty. So um, it's a way of transcending oneself, really. And that's why Job's story is very, um, it, it, it's very meaningful for me in terms of uh, finding God um, within and above and around when it doesn't feel within human terms possible to find God. Does that make sense? Well, it does. <laughs> yeah, no, it does make sense. Uh, you know, in that previous quote, let me bring this back up again. Um, hold on. Um, yeah, you know, I was... the, the key to me, the, 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 but the interesting question for me is, you know, this whole question of endurance hmm. and the question of um, resiliency. Yeah. And, um, I know that in my life as a rabbi over all the years um, where people are in the midst of very difficult circumstances of, of tremendous loss and grief or illness. Um, I'm almost speechless about this, but I, for, for whatever reason, not only have I observed this, but I've experienced this, that um, I call it the well of strength. And the well of strength for a person, I have seen repeatedly, almost always ends up being deeper than people think it is. Uh, the people have the capacity for endurance that they don't think they have. And they have the capacity um, to find the strength to get through. Um, I have, in all my years as a rabbi, thank God I've never experienced this personally because I couldn't imagine it. But when I've been with parents who've lost children and they do go on with life, and I still look at that and say, wow how I guess it's by people do that because they have to. Um, but that well of strength runs deep. Um, and that's, I think, where the reality and mystery meet. Where the reality of suffering meets the well of mystery. And that well of mystery is, I think, a well of strength, spiritual strength or otherwise. And in our own very private ways, we, we draw on that. Now, am I saying that well of strength is God? I wouldn't say it, um, but that well of strength is something. Um, what I find interesting about Wiesel's quote is God is there, but in the, I like in the word, in the filigree of life. Um, God what is present. What does that mean? What does that mean? I I've think, never heard the word filigree used that way. I never have either. I think and, of jewelry. Huh? I think of jewelry. Yeah, filigree is like the finer detail carvings mm -hmm. on the wall. Complexity. Um, mm -hmm. The complexity. It, it, okay. it filigree refers to fine detail. In the yeah. finer, in the fine detail of things. Um, I I um come from Istanbul originally, so we, there's a lot of filigree jewelry in the <laughs> in that area, and um, the, I, the way I see filigree filigree is a as a beautiful maze that uses 
space and structure and material in such a way that a design is formed, even though there's so much emptiness, yet there is still a design that is very strong that can be held, you know, uh, can hold itself up almost, you know, in a piece of jewelry or or carving. It's a, it's a, it's a really interesting interplay of substance and absence, and uh, that's why I love it um, that he used in filigree. Because really, even if we don't understand God's presence or feel God's presence at one level of perception, at another level, it's always there and holding us up. And that's sort of how I I read it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds. I always appreciate your comments. Yeah. So much. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do want to tell you a story. Back in the 1990s, I was a rabbi in Greenwich, Connecticut. And um, together with the superintendent of schools there, um, he and I wrote a piece of legislation to create um, a human rights commission for, for the, the, the town of Greenwich. Um, and we were, and the reward for doing that is we were made the first co-chairs of the commission. And after it was created, we had uh, what we called a, a community convocation. It was a, a day of community celebrations around diversity, inclusion, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it was really uh, what made it especially remarkable day is that Ellie Wiesel came and was the speaker for this convocation wow. event. And um, <clears throat> I had never, ha I'd never had a chance to speak with him before. And, um, and I'd read his books and we you know, talked and just an amazingly gentle person. And um, but I asked him a question I'd always wanted to ask him. In, in, in his book, Night, there's a scene in the book um, where everyone in the camp is forced to line up and they're about to hang three people for stealing. Um, and one of them is a little boy. Uh, and the scene goes that the camp has been required to assemble to see the hanging take place. And then they had to walk by the three people after they've been hanged. And um, as they're, they're, they're standing there and this is all about to happen, someone standing behind Wiesel says, where is God now? And there's no answer. And then they do the hanging and they notice that the boy, little boy is so light, he's, he's alive, but he's hanging by the noose, mm -hmm. struggling between life and death. Mm -hmm. And um, they make the march and they, they walk in front and um, all of a sudden Wazell, right when he gets in front of the boy, the same person behind him said, so where is God now? And Wiesel answers, pointing to the boy, he's hanging here on this gallows. Uh, and uh, the, the impression from reading that scene is that Wiesel was suggesting God is struggling between life and death, like the little boy was struggling between life and death. And I always wanted to ask Wiesel about that. And so I had the chance. And I described the scene, which he knew. And I said, so do you think, I said, do you think God is still struggling? <laughs> and he answered and he said, for some, yes. And for others, no. You know, the struggle is God is struggling between life and death. Uh, this notion that God exists when we let God in. And there are some people who let God in and God is very alive. And there are some people who don't let God in and God is very dead. 
And I thought that was, his answer was very profound to me. Um, that when all is said and done, um, we make our way through these experiences of life. And thankfully, hopefully we have people around us to help us through. And um, some will access that well of faith and that well of strength, some won't. Um, I think it goes back to the filigree um, analogy where there's really, if you look at it, there's a lot of emptiness and at the same time, there's support all around it. So the last quote I want to show you before we conclude is from Rabbi Harold Kushner, of course, wrote the book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. It's a classic. Um, I, I'll say this sort of tongue in cheek. Every rabbi in the world wished they had been the one to write that book. Um, <laughs> because it, it articulated what all of us were thinking and had studied. And it's, you know, it's a still to this day, sweet book, one of the most read and published in languages around the world of, of any book ever written. Um, he said, we can't pray that God make our lives free of problems. This won't happen. And it is probably just as well. We can't ask him to make us and those we love immune to diseases because, Kushner said, he can't do that. And that formed the heart and the controversy of that book, of, of Kushner's book, because he, after reading Job, and he analyzes Job at the beginning of that little book, he comes to the conclusion that in the end, what's really been flawed is our childlike belief that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. And basically says, there are some things God can't do, uh, including changing what Kushner pointed out was the quality of existence um, that will always be in part dominated by random things, random events, random causes, random issues, random circumstances. And for him, he found peace in coming to acceptance of that. But based on the notion that God is limited. So if you believe in a limited God, a more realistic view of God, as he would suggest, then there's less to be angry at God about. There are things God can do and things God can't do. Before we conclude, I was wondering what your thoughts are about that. I guess my question is just in, in definition of can't versus won't. Yeah. Yeah, please. Can, well, can you certainly Kushner, not do it or he just chooses? Kushner's conclusion was there are things he can't do. Like God can't break the laws of nature. But it creates nature. So how but if God, but if God creates nature as a logical system, God then breaks the laws of nature, means God is not logical. And if God is not logical, then God is not God. Hmm. Hmm. Is what Kushner would argue. And in order for God to be logical, God has to be limited. It's a Limit. crazy idea, but. <laughs> so instead of thinking, you know, praying to a God that's all powerful, all knowing. How about just praying to a God that's more powerful, more knowing. Why is our God always portrayed as external to us? 
<laughs> in, in other words, I guess my view of God is that God is within us mm -hmm. and, uh, and has maybe some limitations. I don't know, but I'm I'm still dealing with this idea that God is always outside in heaven, on a throne in the in the heavens, on top of a mountain. When I think of God as being everywhere, including inside of us, and that we have some of the qualities that are godlike to create, we create life, and we and we, and if there are diseases, we try to create solutions to those diseases and we don't do, you know and god is within us to help us do it this is leslie here so when when i fall down well i i can fall down by myself will god help me get up can he help me get up I think that is what personal faith is all about. Um, I, I've told you this, and I think we've heard it from others in this group, that um, to a point, the world is rational. Um, and then there's more beyond that. There's a mystical quality of life as well. Uh, and that there are, there, there are aspects within us uh, that have a divine resonance um, that seem to reflect the divine attributes that get expressed through us. And I think we have an ability as humans, uh, not just as Jews, but as humans to draw on those mysterious mystical dimensions of consciousness, the Kabbalists, are the ones who try to describe those mystical dimensions of consciousness as rooted in God, in God's self. And, you know, I think our life experience has been that, at least for many, that there's a point where we reach the limits of reason uh, and we venture into the realm of mystery. And through entering that realm, which is a very personal, private and subjective experience, uh, we, we, it, it's possible to connect with all kinds of things that are enhancing to the rational conscious part of our lives. And this old fashioned, we call theistic model of you know there's God is over God is over here and humans are over here. There's some kind of reaction connection, but that they're innately separate um, is what you know biblical religion is all about. But we've progressed a lot, and human spiritual awareness and the, I think the skill spiritual. Spirituality, I think, is in part a skill that it evolves and develops over the course of a life. Um, we realize that we live, you know, both in the world of the known um, and in the world of the noumenal, uh, that which is on the edge of what we know, it's that has a mysterious quality. Um, And I think, you know, most of us could probably relate to that. Any final comments? Well, thank you. What I'd like to do today is um, say Kaddish. Thank you. Thank you. And um, because I know we have some yard sites and let me just take this away. Just bear with me for one minute.
And I'm just gonna bring this up for everybody. Hold on. <laughs> Leslie, did you know there's an owl watching you? <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> well, <he does. laughs> owl unique. That that is a great horned owl fledgling <laughs> in my tree. Oh, really? Tree. Wow. Great. In a cottonwood tree. Wow. Oh, so cool. And I, I climbed a ladder to take the picture. Amazing. Wow. That's amazing. So I've pulled up the cottage from our service. And let's just take a moment and please share the names of the people you are remembering this Shabbat. Paula Blatcher. Henry and Rachel Wheeler. David Paul. Let us join together. Yitkadal, Shemay, Vyama, the <laughs> Vietadar, Vietala, Vietala, Shemade Kusha, Varihu, Leela, Minko, Yahata, Vishirata, Tushpahata, Vinehemata, Dami Ran, Yalma, Vimruame, Yehe Shmoma, Rabba Min Shemaya, the Hayim Aleni. Yisrael, May all of their memories forever be a blessing. And let us be reminded that the most enduring memorials we can make to the people we love who are now gone uh, are not made of bronze or stone. Uh, the most enduring memorials are made through acts of love and kindness toward others. Amen. 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 Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Thanks, shalom. thanks shalom. for coming to class. And uh, it was great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for a beautiful Shabbat. service. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rabbi. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Have a great day. You okay. too.